Hi, I was listening to a talk show featuring Caitlin Flanagan. And Caitlin is sort of a Socrates for the suburban school mom set. In the sense that she makes you feel smart in an, in an entertaining way, but doesn't necessarily add to any sort of consistent body of knowledge or wisdom. And what I mean by that is similar to an old wives tale. It sounds good, it feels good, and it may even be true, but when, unless you test it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is true, even though it's been passed on from generation to two generation and might have worked in the past. And on this episode, she was discussing uh, the pandemic COVID-19 vaccines. And within this episode, she was saying that she herself had taken the vaccine, and, including a booster, but she was fine with public safety officers choosing whether or not to have them. And right now we're going through an interesting, well, interesting times. The president of the United States is, has, has mandated for not only the government, but for private employers to make sure their employees get the vaccine. With respect to government employees under his own jurisdiction, those rulings have mostly held up because they've included exemptions for uh, religion. So for example, Christian scientists and so on. They have not held up so well in the private sector, but that's beside the point. We're going off topic. What I wanted to discuss is her rationale for allowing individual public safety officers to decide for themselves whether or not they want to take the vaccine, and despite the fact that they are government employees under, under the jurisdiction of the president. And that, that would include police officers, firefighters, and so on. And what she was saying is that if you're going to put your life on the line and you're going to run into a burning building and you just don't want to take the vaccine because you don't think it's safe or you don't feel like it, you should be able to make that choice for yourself. It feels good. You know, when she said that, you initially side with her. The audience clapped. You know, you've got these visions of, you know, muscular men running into burning buildings and saving a child. So, of course, of course, that kind of a person should decide his or her, his or her health and safety issues on a personal basis. But let's examine why, like an old, old wives tale, it just doesn't add up. And that's one of the fundamental problems right now in this country is a lot of things sound good, but once you analyze them, they just don't make any sense. It's been that way for a long time. We'll, we'll try to explain why. So, first of all, it's absolutely true that some, some professions require more physical danger than others. But within law enforcement and public safety, because that physical danger is intertwined with the ability to use a gun, lethal force, including, including in the case of firefighters, force that allows them to destroy a home or perhaps a home next door or in order to you know, better fight a fire, it allows firefighters, not just police officers, the ability to do things that none of us would be able to do without being charged with a crime. Same thing with police officers. If you're execu executing a search warrant in an apartment complex, you know, you're allowed to go into somebody else's apartment, not the perpetrators. And in, in the process of catching or apprehending a criminal, a suspected criminal, you are allowed to damage property. You, you give public safety officers that kind of discretion because it's part of their job. But in doing so, we require trust. And that trust 
is based not only on proper training, but also on the fact that police officers and firefighters are subject to checks and balances within a system of which there are only one part of the government. There are two other parts besides the executive branch, obviously the judicial sector and the legislative sector. Without those two branches existing, you would not have checks and balances over misconduct by police officers or even incompetence, depending on, how, depending on, on the burden of proof and how the laws are written. And so when you allow police officers to make decisions that affect public safety for themselves in a way that exempts them from the normal process or the normal analysis applicable to the public that they serve, and when that rationale or exemption is not based on something essential or necessarily intertwined with their position, you're creating a class of people that are exempt from oversight and that will believe that they are exempt from oversight. And you can see that now when I applied for my business license, there are, you know, I, I have to, I'm subject, I'm subject to payment. I have to pay for a business license, but there are exemptions. And, you know, it's quite obvious that the government has carved out for itself exemptions that are not necessarily, well, that don't always apply to everyone else. One of them is a military. That lines up exactly with how money is spent on the national level. We look at, on the local level, we look at exemptions for public safety officers, and at the state level, exemptions for teachers. And we put all these things together, and what you have is a government that's carved out for itself special privileges. And once you give a privilege to a sector of people, it's hard to take that privilege away. They, it becomes known as an entitlement. And so the problem with Flanagan's logic, and there is no logic, it's feelings, is that it doesn't understand that public safety officers, including police officers, are part of a system of checks and balances. And if you allow them exemptions that the lawyers don't get, or the judges don't get, or the legislators don't get, you're disrupting that fine-tuned set of checks and balances in a way that promotes eventual, I'm not gonna use the word fascism, in a way that promotes unaccountability by one branch, particularly against, at the expense of other branches. It's a better way to say it. And that's happened before in history. And the reason it's important is because, again, that level of discretion is greater than within the executive branch, what is given to others, other branches of government. And that is precisely because of the, not only the physical safety issue, but just the fact that the executive branch is the one on the ground floor. In a sense, it's the government's grassroots arm. So number one, Flan Flanagan's speech or monologue does not include any context and that's a problem because she is a product of an Ivy League home. Uh, she went to a, she herself went to a public, Ivy, a quote unquote public Ivy League school. She has multiple degrees and so on and so forth. But she doesn't understand the law in her own country. She doesn't, she doesn't understand the system in her own country. Well, maybe she does, but obviously not very well. And this is a problem because when the elites become disconnected from the principles of the system that they're sworn to uphold, that also allows the executive branch to run roughshod over not just constitutional principles, but the very foundation of that system of, system of checks and balances, which is that oversight is necessary for accountability. And if you're going to do an exemption, historically, that exemption has been tied to a necessary, something necessary. In other words, you can't comply. So if you're disabled, you can't comply with a local ordinance that requires you to mow your own lawn or at least not keep a lawn that is unkempt. If you can't comply with that, then there's always been an exemption for you. Those exemptions 
as I've grown up have multiplied in part because the system of checks and balances has failed. So many people now, we'll elaborate, this on this, elaborate on this later on, have claimed exemptions that have been approved that it's made a mockery of the system of checks and balances. And so everyone's now gotten in on the game. That's not because there's something wrong with exemptions based on an, an, an inability to comply. It's based on the fact that once you have government unions that interpret the laws that they help pass, there's a tendency to, to be more inclusive than exclusive in order to maintain power and the status quo. And that's where we get away from principles, we get away from logic, and we, get a, we, get, we move towards a society that's based more on, on getting along with each other, in other words, feelings, as opposed to a, princip a principled system that can stand the test of time, or that is better able to stand the test of time, because it, a principled system can include empathy as part of its components, but a, an unprincipled system will always fail, because you're not gonna be able to come up with a universal you know, system of principles or a universal idea that applies across the board and that allows merit to rise up. Now, when you put all these things together, you have a failure on the part of the elites to understand their own system, which is, is also what is driving the power of the executive branch over the other branches. And let me give you an example of, of what I just talked about, about empathy. So a Supreme Court case just came out, a decision uh, that, that related to the death penalty. I believe the case is Ham with two M's versus Reeves. And it's a sad case. And it was a 5-4 decision in favor of execution. Now, let me, let me say that this man would have been executed anyway. The question was, how, does he get to choose how he gets executed by the state. And it involved the Americans with Disabilities Act because he apparently did not, was given a form where he had to choose his method of execution. This is just becoming you know, surreal. And that's why a lot of judges, including on the Supreme Court, have historically just not wanted to deal with the death penalty and have wanted to ban it just simply because you end up in these rid just ridiculous positions where you have an inmate that's going to be executed, that's given a form that is written in legalese by the lawyers, not the executive, not the executive branch, and is told to select how he or she wants to die. Well, apparently one of the options was nitrogen, nitrogen hypoxia. I, I've got above an 11th grade education, and I'm not sure I would have understood that had it been given to me. And it, the decision doesn't really get into the fact of what was exactly on the form, but he had a choice, and he chose something other than, he chose lethal injection. And later on, this person who apparently can't, obviously is not at an, at an 11th grade level, reading level, changes his mind and says, listen, I didn't understand the form. I'm frightened of dying by lethal injection. I want this other method that I've been told, presumably is less painful. And that's nitrogen, a gas of some sort, I, I imagine. And it takes you know, the executive branch in order to comply with these changes, would have to delay the execution date by a few weeks. It's not something that's typically requested. And it's, this matter gets appealed. And the Supreme Court says, no, you've got to execute this person using the choice on the form that he claims that he, that he does not understand. And it was a 5-4 decision. And you can see how, if you're a cynic, you can see how the lawyers might have engineered this situation in order to provide this man with, this, this convict with, uh, a few more weeks of life. But you can also see just the, I don't even know the words for it, ludicrousness. I mean, you can just see how once you start creating these sorts of systems that have to be implemented by ordinary people, 
you can see how simplicity has to be part of the, the component of governance, and it just hasn't been. There is no common person, even a lawyer today, that understands all the laws to which he or she, she is subject. And every time there's been a movement to move, a, to move into a simpler system, it hasn't worked. Part of that is because society has become more complex, and I fear that this complexity has robbed us of empathy. Because, and, and there's no doubt this decision represents that loss of empathy. Because if you can't allow somebody who, with the facts, say is, is unable to understand a form, if you can't allow that person to choose his own method of, of dying, of being, I shouldn't say being executed, there's something wrong with the system. And you have, in this case, the executive, executive branch having essentially co-opted the judicial branch in this case, because what will be the cost? Again, a few weeks, you've got more labor hours that have to be used in order to change the method of execution. And it doesn't seem as if, I mean, the, the evidence was there. Four, four courts apparently ruled in this person's favor with respect to the form. And the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision says, that's okay, we'll go ahead and rubber stamp what the, what the executive branch wants. And that's possible not only because there's a majority on the Supreme Court that is linked to the executive branch, both racially and re religiously. It's possible also because the person being executed might not have been of the same background as the elites on the bench and so on, in, in the majority and so on and so forth. When you start to look at the system of laws as less as a system of principles and more as a system of just power. And as we all know, we've been told power corrupts. But when, when it corrupts in this way, in a way that allows a dissenting opinion, in this case written by Justice Kagan, to thoroughly eviscerate the majority decision, you get the sense that the legal system has failed. Not only in providing checks and balances, but also in terms of maintaining the credibility to provide those necessary checks and balances. And part of that is because there's always been this feeling between the executive branch uh, of antipathy towards the people that would deign or dare to place checks and balances upon them. And you see that with one of these judges um, once said that he was allowed to visit or he went to visit a prison and there just happened to be a riot at that prison on that same day that allowed him to see the executive branch in action. And he felt, he didn't say this, but he felt like it was staged and so on and so forth. But aside from that, there's this idea that the executive branch has that it can do everything the lawyers can do, but the lawyers can't do what they can do or wouldn't want to. It's the same joke that was made in law school, that the jocks in high school become the police officers and the nerds become the lawyers. It's a continuation of that human dynamic. And the reason that's problematic is because on the one hand, it may be true, though obviously not always, but in cases where it's true, it explains a lot of the reasons for that antipathy. Let's take uh, blue collar workers, which you know you can see police officers as blue collar workers, or sometimes patrolling the beat, they're on their feet, they're driving a car, they're dealing with tangible things, not abstract things. And you can see how when you're dealing with things, tangible things, you can see how passing a law, especially if it's complicated, isn't going to muster any sort of respect compared to whatever system works on the ground floor that prevents somebody from getting his or her hand finger cut off. And if that system that's been in place has worked and the people believe it works, whether or not you pass a law won't change anything. And that's particularly, well, you, we have in the law, you know, expert witnesses. 
you know, they're supposed to help the court navigate these issues. But a lot of times now, those experts are hired guns. And so they just say whatever that side wants them to say and so on and so forth. And so again, that goes back to a, an unprincipled situation. And so here we are. And because of that dynamic of the blue collar system, always having an emotional leg up on the abstract. There has to be a recognition that the system of checks and balances requires credibility, more so in order to be maintained. But it also seems to require some empathy, but you can't have, you have to have credibility before you can have empathy. And when you look at this blue collar aspect, there's no question that there's a bit of sexism involved as well, because when you're dealing with tangible things, you know, I've sat in on, well, men have an inherent advantage without the use of technology. And I've sat in on meetings with lawyers where they're trying to help blue collar workers and they come up with a system of laws that, again, doesn't seem to understand the underlying dynamics on the ground floor. And I've sat there myself thinking, you know, none of you would be able to do these jobs. You know, stand, you know standing on your feet eight hours a day uh, and just dealing with customers, that's a difficult job. It's also a physically tasking job. And it's not an easy job if you've ever done it. And what people at the, in the elitist institutions, I shouldn't even use that word, but what people in white collar professions don't seem to understand is that when they're dealing with blue collar professions, the more laws they pass, unless those laws are simple and make sense, in many cases, they only serve to allow within that workforce, the lazier people to coexist with the harder working people. And so this is a little bit more obvious when you're dealing with blue collar workers because they tend to deal with physical things that can be counted. And so, you know, widgets and so on. And so you, if somebody isn't pulling his or her weight, the harder working person is clearly going to be, you know, dealing with more work. And so if that system of laws doesn't involve some amount of fairness, you can see how there's going to be disdain across the board for the people that would deign or dare to provide oversight. And that dynamic, again, and applies across the board, and so on and so forth. The reason that I bring that up is because technology has in some cases made the law superfluous. So if you are dealing with widgets, well, think about how a car used to be made compared to how it's made now. Now it's automated. You know, you need fewer workers and the machines are doing a lot of the work. It's still physically tasking, but technology has done its job. It's made the, the manufacture of, of physical things easier and faster. And so as a result, it's sort of, it's harder to make those arguments because that what used to be made that, you know, women shouldn't have a place in society within the manufacturing plant because they're physically weaker. And so they're not going to be able to keep up. The same argument was made for police officers. And again, once you add technology, you start to see how technology, if it's not backed by credibility, renders the non-executive branches superfluous. Because if I can if I can perfect technology that allows women to to do whatever it is that a, that a man does, or to reduce the heavy labor to the point where you need more at least more brains than brawn, I've solved the sexism problem in the workforce. You know, who wouldn't want you know somebody next to him or her who is able to do more or the same level of work at the same level of quality. And so you can see it and start, start to empathize with why the lawyers have been disdained and why the judges have placed abstract principles over tangible goals and tangible limitations. What we don't realize is that is that, that same technological issue also creates more of a need 
for judges and lawyers, not fewer. Why? Because that same technology with DNA evidence, with facial recognition, allows, with digital manipulation, allows anybody in the, high enough in the executive branch to make someone guilty on a whim. You don't like John Lennon being in this country? No problem. Deny the visa or, or deport him. Find a problem in the application. We don't want Djokovic, the tennis star, to play in the Australian Open. Okay, even when lawyers are involved. Just look what happened. The lawyers said he could stay in the country and play in the, in the Open. What happened? The executive branch overruled that decision. They overruled the other branches. Even when the other branches were involved and had the same level of knowledge. Think about that for a second. It's not just a sporting event. We're dealing with the executive branch for the last 20 years, 20 plus years, forcing the submission of the other two branches. And here we are. But why is it that we need more, not less, non-executive branch participation? Because with technology able to frame anybody now without any physical evidence, or at least to, well, you can see how you need more checks and balances, not fewer. So technology within governance forces more, not less oversight. And we're not there yet. And why? Well, here's the real tragedy. It's not just a man being executed in a way that he, in a way that could have been less psychologically painful. It's the fact that this country has lost its principles for the last 20 plus years. And as a result, it is allowing competitors, allies, not just enemies, to take over the mantle of Western civilization. And by, that, by this, I mean the EU. And this country doesn't seem at its elitist institutions, at its high level institutions, willing or able to take on the task of restoring the credibility that it, that it lost and the respect that it lost by allowing Guantanamo Bay to be open, still open today. Um, that's important because the president, when running for election, promised to close it down. You can see how the executive branch, because of its ability to create false flags, not just a judge happening to visit a prison on the day a riot occurs, but the Gulf of Tonkin. Think about the military. Think about how easy it is to start a war now with technology. Think about with deep fakes, how easy it is to create manufactured media that forces the executive branch to do things that are, that are not good for society or even for themselves. When Flanagan says, let's apply a different standard that's not tied into something necessarily linked with the job. Let's allow more discretion, but less oversight over the, over the executive branch. She represents a failure of, she's not progressive, of the educated class in doing this job for the last 21 years. And because of that, it's difficult to see how this country is going to, to thrive. It will survive, but just imagine a country that's divided and has, in, in the sense that it has, doesn't need to, no state has to secede. They can simply, through their executive branches, enforce some laws and not others, or interpret some laws differently by allowing police unions or benevolent, quote, quote unquote, benevolent associations to help elect governors who then appoint judges or in states where judges are allowed to run for election to help elect the judges that see the law the same way as the executive branch, which again, always gets paid because the fastest way to get funding by the government is of course, fear. And it's precisely because of that, that you have to create these systems of checks and balances in peacetime.
Because when there's wartime, there's no question that some branches are more essential than others. That the executive branch is more essential than all the other branches. And that's why they get more leeway. That's why you have martial law or suspension of law. And so what's happened, though, is that despite the best efforts of the non-executive branches, what's happened really is that as they've tried to implement checks and balances, there's been a, a slew of employees, including ones that have been terminated, terminated or fired for misconduct, that have simply gone into the private sector and done whatever it was they were doing before. So think about, again, within this context of fewer and less credible checks and balances, the rise of not only technology, but the private security state, the private security organizations of the NS, we have the NSA, but now you also have the NSO group. You have Operation Whistle Pig. You have private security companies that are funded by sovereign governments that spy on journalists all over the world. Again, technology is global. So within all of this, you can imagine the future, a future in the United States, similar to the movie Logan that came out a few years ago, where not only private security carve, is in charge, but carves out its own exemptions. And so you end up in a society with 50 states that are essentially distinct from each other in terms of principles, but just happen to speak the same language. Interestingly enough, I mentioned the EU. The EU is going the other way. They're coming up with a legal system that is going to be consistent across the board in a place where people don't speak the same language. That's forcing them to get better at things like translation, at articulating principles and so on. They're actually rising to the challenge. When I was growing up, a euro was worth less than the US dollar by at least 20%. Now, it's, it's the other way around. The euro is worth more. When you lose sight of checks and balances, when you lose credibility, that affects where people want to live, it affects where people want their money to be kept. It affects everything. So that's why Flanagan is wrong. And what scares me isn't that she's wrong. She has no idea that she's wrong. She thinks she's being nice.